Good morning. Uh, welcome to Kezprez. Let us know you're there. Uh, why don't some people just... Sandy's joined. Great. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, let us know. Uh, we can see you signing in. Uh, but why don't you just even just say hi in your uh, box and then uh, and then we'll have it recorded for posterity's sake. So let me welcome you to House Church here at Kezprez during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, churches everywhere have had to move online and we are one of them. So thank you for joining us, whether you call Kezprez home or whether you're on the other side of the country or the other side of the world. Uh, we're glad that you've joined us. Uh, today, um, just a couple of instructions. You'll be able to see Charity on Facebook is going to be po posting the words and everything you need to know. And then Eric, graciously on YouTube, is also going to do the same. So look under the comments page and you'll be able to, uh, to sing along. In fact, we even have some of our worship team who are playing along with us this morning in their own homes. So we are so glad that you've joined us. For those who call Kez Press Home, there's just a, a few announcements that we would like to do as we get going. So hi everyone, um, and we are learning as we go, <laughs> uh, um, trying something new um, and different every week. So just a reminder to those of you um, who are part of our grow groups, our men's grow group and our women's grow group, Men, uh, both groups have moved to the Zoom platform so we can uh, see one another and hear one another and catch up with one another online. So me the men are meeting uh, Monday night at 8 o'clock and the women are meeting Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. You do need an invitation from Kirk and I to um, hook up to the Zoom platform. And so if you're interested in joining us for either of those times, even if you're not a part of the regular grow groups, we'd welcome you to join in with us. Um, and so you can just be in touch with us by email or through Facebook um, to ask us to be included in the invitation. And this week we're trying uh, something else new. We're going to try uh, children's worship time through the Zoom platform on Thursday evening. So each of our children's um, worship uh, classes, um, Midler, Junior, and Senior, will be meeting at different times, but everybody's meeting on Thursday night. And so this is just to provide a little bit of time um, with our kids during the week. So the Midlers are gonna be meeting with Lisa at three o'clock, the Juniors with Ben at seven, and then the Senior Highs with uh, Paul at eight. Again, you will need an invitation from us um, to join that group. We're going to be sending the invitation out to all of our um, Kespres kids, all of our Kespres family, <coughs> but if there are others of you who want to include your kids in that time of uh, learning and just some time together, um, just be in touch with us again by email or through Facebook to ask us to send the invitation to you as well. Um, the work of the Gathering Place uh, continues in our community. In, uh, they've had to accommodate and make some changes as well. Uh, so the meal this Thursday is takeout only. And this week, uh, the meal is being served from our church home, from the Kesbra's Kitchen. Um, a small group of volunteers maintaining social distancing are putting together a meal, as well as some really generous uh, restaurants who have offered to come to our help. From the community. Um, so we ask that you would spread the word for those that you know that are in need of a meal on Thursday nights between 5 and 6. They can drop by Kesprez and uh, pick up a takeout meal from the door or they can contact Roots Georgina and have the meal picked up for them and delivered to them. So if you know someone who's in need of that, please um, let them know that that's available. And for those of you who are a part of our Kespres family, we are continuing on with our study in the New City Catechism. We're taking a little bit of a, a break from it this week, but we want to encourage you to keep going. So this week's question is question 28. Keep going, keep reading these um, over together, learning them together, reviewing them together as we uh, build our faith on a strong foundation. We're going to be picking it up again in the next few weeks as we move into the Easter season, but uh, we want to encourage you to keep going as we read through this together. 
I think that's it for the announcements for this morning. It's still early here at Kesprez. Uh, we usually don't even start the announcements until now. So we'll see people continuing to wander in. And again, look under the comments and you'll see Charity, who is graciously again helping us out with the words. So uh, just uh, kind of join along and, and sing and if you know the songs together. So let us, uh, let us worship God. Jesus says, come to me all you are weary and tired, exhausted and worried and fearful. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. You give life, you 
I love You bring light to the darkness You give hope You restore every heart that is broken And great are you, Lord You give life, you are love Give life, you are love, you are love. You bring light to the dark. You give hope, hope. you restore, you restore. silent, even the rocks will cry out. But the whole world gathers this day. That even though one day has often melded into the next day, today is a different day. Today is your day. So we gather. We gather from different homes, from different communities, from different parts of our country, from different parts of the world, we gather as your church, knowing that we are not alone, 
that you have not abandoned us, that you are with us and you are with our families. So God, as we set time apart, as we set time apart, we gather to worship, we gather to sing, and we gather to pray the words that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Can the kids come a little closer to the screen for just a minute? Because uh, we want to go over a song that we know, and uh, let's go over the actions first. And then we'll sing, and then I have a special guest. Um, that He's uh, not too comfortable being on camera, and uh, he's not on too comfortable, in fact, being even... Um, inside but um, but he's going to join us so the song is our God is a great big God so our God is a great big God so it gets bigger our God is a great big God our God is a great big God easy word so far right our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands and he holds us in his hands. Okay. He's higher than a skyscraper. You gotta go really high. And he's deeper than a submarine. So pluck your nose and go underwater. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. He's known me and he's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan, the other hand. Okay, we try that again. And he's higher than a skyscraper. That's good, way to go David, Isabel. And he's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. And he's known me, and hugged yourself, and he's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. Okay? Can we try it together? Our God is a great big God. Okay? <coughs> Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great 
Okay, let me go get my friend. See if he's here. Just a sec. Hello? Who's there? My name is the Moose. The Moose? The Moose. And uh, I know you usually don't see me uh, inside, but that's where I've been because that's what I've been told. I'm supposed to stay inside. Are you supposed to stay inside too? Yep. I hear you. You're supposed to stay inside because uh, you keep others safe. And you know what that reminds me of? There's a question that we did in our catechism a long time ago. And it says, what does the law of God require? Do you remember? That we, let me give you a hint, that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, right? So we love God first. Everybody knows that. That's why we're here. And we love who second? Ourselves? Nope. We love others. And then we love ourselves. We love God first. We love others. And then we love ourselves. So when we love ourselves then we can do whatever we want and we could go outside even though people say we shouldn't because we might harm other people. Because if we have a virus, we could give it to somebody. So it's better to stay inside and that shows that we love others before we love ourselves. So let's try it again. What does the law of God require? That we Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right, I heard you. And that we love our neighbor, that's everybody else, as ourselves. Way to go. Can we pray? And then I'm going to go have a sleep. Okay, okay. Let's, let's bow our heads. Thank you, God, that you love us. Help us to love you, to love others, and to love ourselves. Thank you. See ya. Okay, so Vamus is going to go and just lie down for a few minutes. He's kind of tired. Uh, in fact, he's playing with Finnegan right now. So, uh, Charity's going to post our responsive reading this morning. It's taken from Psalm 46, from the NIV. So if you uh, want to read the second verse, and I'll read the first verse. Sorry, Charity, my, my uh, comments aren't scrolling, so I can't see. So I'm going to need some help with Eric and Charity with our prayer request today. Uh, Psalm 46, are you ready? Great words for us today. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, uh, I'm reading to us from the book of Job, and I'm uh, just reading through a speech that God makes in the book of Job, starting at chapter 38, but then I'm moving on to chapter um, 42, when Job responds to God. This is God's word for us this morning. Then the Lord answered Job from the center of the whirlwind. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourselves like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place? When I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shape the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you ever journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. Which is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths of their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no one in it, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their season or lead the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? And after a long time, Job responds, I know that you can do all things and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely, I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is God's word for us this morning. May he bless it to our understanding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So Job, Job was a wealthy man by many standards. He had a strong faith. He had a, a large family, a wife. He had seven sons and three daughters, the perfect number of each. And for those of you who might be finding yourselves at home these days with fewer than the perfect number, you can maybe utter a prayer of thanks this morning that you aren't Job with 10 children to entertain. Job's wealth was diversified beyond that of his immediate household. He had investments as well. He had herds numbering in the thousands of sheep and camels, oxen and donkeys, and a large staff to manage all of his operations. But then, in a moment without any warning, everything was gone. Flocks and herds, farmhands and managers, house, children, it was all, all gone, all wiped out. Everything except for his wife, which some of you might think was just a different kind of cruel suffering. But seriously, in all of this, through all of this, Job was still standing. He was still grounded, and he was still willing and even able to praise God. And then one more final blow. Job developed a horribly painful skin disease, blistering sores all over his body, which cracked and broke open and oozed. His wife, mocking him, urged him just to get it over with, to let loose on God and let God strike him dead, to, to put him out of his misery. But Job said nothing. His three closest friends came and sat with him, at first in silence, quietly observing Job's suffering. And finally, after seven days of silence, Job began to open up, to say exactly what was on his mind, and he, he doesn't hold back. He wishes, he begins by wishing that he had never been born, but like most of us, once we get talking, we get looser with our words, we're more candid, more outspoken, more brutally honest, and that was Job. And Job's friends, they were really no help at all. They made the same unhelpful kind of comments that people make whenever tragedy strikes, offering the same kind of empty religious, religious platitudes. You must have done something to make God angry. You had this coming to you. Clearly, God is just trying to teach you a lesson. If only you could figure out what that lesson was. Job himself had questions about God. He and God had once been so close, and now God wasn't even taking his calls. And finally, finally after a long silence, God speaks. Of course, it wasn't really a long silence. Until now, Job and his friends have done all the talking, and they really didn't leave any room for God. But God now comes to Job in the middle of a whirlwind. God meets Job in the middle of his storm. It might surprise you to learn that the book of Job is actually the oldest book of the Bible. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, while it records the story of the beginning, the creation, and then the fall from what God had envisioned for that creation, humanity, and all other parts of the creative order, a story which would have been handed down orally, told from one generation to another, was actually written down sometime later. But the oldest recorded writing of the Bible is from the book of Job. Because suffering is almost as old as time itself. It is the age-old question, why does God allow suffering? You'll notice that 
No one seems to ask why the devil uses suffering to tempt us, to break us, to force his way between us and God. Why? Why is the question that Job begins with? Why? But over the course of his long soliloquies, his question stops being a question and it turns into an accusation. In my suffering, God has abandoned me. Why? It's the question we all ask in the face of suffering. Suffering comes in many different forms. It keeps us up in the middle of the night. It is shed in silent tears. It is heard in moaning and crying. It makes us question what we thought we knew, what we thought we believed. And these are great days of great suffering. Maybe not yet in our communities, but you only have to watch the horrific video footage from Italy or Spain or New York City to get a sense of the chaos and the grief that is now enveloping those cities. But of course, this isn't the first period of enormous suffering in history, nor is it the first pandemic. There were plagues that we hear about in the Bible, and there are others that we learn from our history books, the Black Death in the Middle Ages and the Spanish flu in the early 20th century. HIV AIDS is today considered an ongoing pandemic. For most of us, this is the first time we have felt threatened or at least inconvenienced by a pandemic. But there have been other pandemics, widespread infectious diseases that have swept across the globe which have caused much suffering and yet much less alarm. Greed, famine, poverty, displaced people seeking freedom and shelter, racism, addiction, homelessness, maybe the worst of all, apathy. These two are pandemics, and I don't at all say that flippantly. It's just that our everyday lives are mostly untouched by them. But perhaps this is the first pandemic, at least in recent memory, that does not discriminate based on country, race, gender, economic bracket, or social status. In the book of Job, we learn that why is not really the question. Even Job discovers that why is not really the question he wants answered. Pastor and author Eugene Peterson writes about this. He says, Job suffered. His name is synonymous with suffering. He asked why. He asked why me. And he puts his questions to God. He asked his questions persistently, passionately, eloquently. He refused to take silence for an answer. He refused to take cliches for an answer. He refused to let God off the hook. Job did not take his sufferings quietly or piously. Job took a stance before God, and there he protested his suffering, and he protested them mightily. Job gives voice to his suffering so well, so accurately and honestly, that anyone who has ever suffered, which includes every last one of us, can recognize his or her pain in the voice of Job. Job says boldly what some of us are too timid to say. He makes poetry out of what many of us is only tangled whimpers. He shouts to God what many of us mutter behind our sleeves. He refuses to accept the role of the defeated victim. But then, but then Job crosses a line. Not only does Job honestly question God, not only does he ask the question why, but over time he, he doesn't even really care anymore about that answer. Instead, he accuses God of being the force behind the suffering. 
And in chapter 9, he shouts, If I summoned God and he answered me, I do not believe that he would listen to my voice, for he crushes me with the storm, and he multiplies my wounds for no reason. He would not let me regain my breath, but he would overwhelm me with misery, for he crushes me with a storm. It's interesting <clears throat> that in our scripture reading this morning, God comes to Job from the middle of the whirlwind. God speaks to Job from the middle of the whirlwind, a powerful and chaotic storm. The real question Job wanted the answer to was not why, why this suffering. The real question Job is asking is where? Where is God in my suffering? It's the same question New York Times columnist James Martin asked this week. Where is God in a pandemic? Notice it doesn't say that God is the whirlwind, but that God comes to Job from the middle of the whirlwind. God is present in the middle of the storm. It reminds me of one of my favorite Jesus stories told in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus and his disciples set out in a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus fell asleep in the boat. And while he slept, this violent storm blew up on the lake, and his disciples, many of whom were experienced fishermen and must have been accustomed to storms like these, they began to panic. And they woke Jesus screaming, Get up and save us! We're going to drown! And after Jesus gave them a talking to about their lack of faith, he told the wind and the waves, quiet down. I love that story because the disciples, these followers of Jesus, they find themselves in the middle of the storm and they are terrified that the next wave is the one that's going to sink them and that they are going to drown. And where is Jesus? He is right there. He is in the boat riding out the storm with them. There was God in the middle of the storm with Job. I can remember it like it was yesterday, though it was about nine years ago now. Kirk was out of town at meetings for a few days, and so Lily and a younger Toffee and I were holding down the fort. It was early June, and it had been a warm and humid day. And around dinner time, the sky grew black, and the air was heavy. And I looked out our front door at the darkening sky, and as I looked out across the street, the neighbor's big maple tree split in two right before my eyes. And what happened next was a whirlwind, literally. Our neighborhood experienced a microburst, a powerful burst of wind akin to a tornado, but different in shape and then followed by heavy downpours. I rushed Lily and the dog down to the basement cold room, a small space lined with our freezer and mostly empty canning jars I was planning to get around to someday. Still mostly empty, by the way. Once they were safe, I ran upstairs to grab a few things, my cell phone, a flashlight, and some bottled water. And then, in a flash of craziness, I went outside and I unhooked the canopy to our gazebo. My rationale being that I didn't want it to become a UFO in our neighborhood. It made sense at the time, but now I see just how dumb it was. And then back down to the basement. The water began pouring into our cold room through a, a small vent in the block wall and around the pipe for our sump pump. Toffee was extremely agitated. He was panting heavily and he was pacing back and forth in a space where there was really no room to pace. And in the midst of it all, we prayed. 
We prayed for safety. We prayed for the storm to pass. We prayed for our neighbors. And I even prayed the toffee would settle down. And just as I said his name, he lay down and he rested his head in Lily's lap. It's something that both she and I vividly remember to this day. In the middle of that storm, we experienced God's presence. In the middle of that storm, we experienced peace in God's presence. We stayed in that small room for a little less than an hour <clears throat> until the water coming in slowed from a stream to a trickle and we could no longer hear the roar of the rushing wind outside. And when we came up above ground, the power of the storm was immediately obvious. Our neighborhood, which is full of beautiful, mature trees, had been scarred. The house at the end of our street, five houses away from us, had been partly crushed by two large fallen maples, but thankfully no one was harmed. Every yard in our neighborhood had fallen trees. I tell you that story for two reasons. One, because when I think of the word whirlwind, that's what I associate with it. This strong, powerful force of destruction that came seemingly from out of nowhere. But I also have a visual in my mind of the physical damage that came as a result of that whirlwind. But in addition to those things, and in hindsight, I can see now that what seemed like a crazy, completely irrational decision on my part to run outside in the middle of this storm to unhook the gazebo canopy was a Job moment in my life. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of uncertainty and fear, <coughs> there I was trying to wrestle back some control, desperate to feel like I could control something, one thing, anything. And all kidding aside, but that is exactly what the toilet paper hoarding is all about. It is our desperate need to feel like we can control one thing. If the pandemic strikes our house, at least I have toilet paper. It's not, it is irrational, it's absolutely crazy. Job, in the middle of a whirlwind of his own and suffering greatly, he is desperate to control something, anything, one thing, and the thing that Job is trying to control is God. And in chapters 37 to 41, one of the most eloquent and powerful glimpses into the realm of God in all of Scripture, God starts asking Job the questions. Questions that both invite Job into conversation and deeper into relationship, but they also invite Job into God's awesome presence. Job, you'll remember, complained that God would overwhelm him with misery but instead in the middle of the chaos of the whirlwind he meets the god who overwhelms him with mystery the mystery that is god and he is comforted not in that his suffering is immediately relieved but he finds comfort and peace and hope in the assurance that God, the great God over all creation, that God sees him and knows him and that he has not abandoned him in his time of need. God is present in Job's suffering because our God is familiar with suffering. Our God knows suffering. Jesus himself suffers not only with us, but also for us. So that we can know the deep love of God. A love that goes to hell and back. 
And so, yes, yes, we find ourselves in this whirlwind. It's not the first storm, and it's not going to be the last. But here's what we can know to be true. God is here. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Charity's going to post the next song, All Creatures of Our God and King, just a great old hymn of the church. So look for Charity's comments, and then just click more, and you'll be able to join us. church every week where we share our prayer requests with one another we pray for them and then we go out and um, care for one another um, in physical ways maybe a, right now a, a caring for one another could be checking in with one another through a phone call or a text I encourage you to use phone as much as you can um, I'm not a huge fan of talking on the phone, but uh, realizing over the last couple of weeks how important it is that um, we hear one another's voices. And so um, I encourage you to reach out and connect with people that way. Um, so if there are prayer requests, if you want to um, uh, text them or um, put them up on Facebook, again, we just, or we're looking for our first names only um, so that uh, we maintain some level of privacy for people. But um, you can let us know. We, uh, we know of one that we'd love for you to pray for. A, um, a young woman named Sarah. 
um, who has gone in this morning to have a baby. And so uh, we want to pray for Sarah and, uh, and her baby this morning. Um, we're continuing to pray for Anne and Lynn and Judy and Murray, um, all of who are um, experiencing cancer at this time. Are there other things, and maybe Charity could just pop me off a text if there's other things that we could be praying for today. We certainly know the financial situations of so many households right now, um, and we want to, uh, to be reminded of the difficulty of uh, so many. We're praying for people in long-term care. Um, we have a number of them uh, connected to our congregation, of course, who are in long-term care. And of course, we are also continuing to pray for people who are um, working in essential services, um, uh, those who are on the front lines in terms of health care, and those who are um, making things available, uh, those companies who are retrofitting to make equipment available, those who are um, continuing to uh, provide services like fire and ambulance, our grocery store workers, our truck drivers who uh, make products available across the country, and for those um, other places who um, are really seeing the impact um, on a large, large scale of uh, the virus that's now um, moving around the world. Okay. All right, let's come together in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for that reminder from Job that um, you have not left us or abandoned us, but you are present with us um, in the middle of the storms of our lives. Not only in the middle of the storms, sometimes it's in the middle of the storms that we are seeking you, God, and we forget about you during all the times when it's smooth sailing and things are going well and we think that we've gotten there on our own or that we are capable of handling all these things on our own or that we really have no need for you because look at how self-sufficient we are. So we thank you for that powerful reminder this morning, God, that you are the creator of the universe that you hold this world in your hands, as we sang with the kids this morning. That you are not a, a distant, an un, a God who is unmoved by our suffering, but that you are a God who participates in our suffering. That you came to be one of us, and to experience that suffering for yourself. Thank you, God, that you hear us when we call out to you in joy and in sorrow, when we celebrate something wonderful in our lives. We give you thanks and praise. When we find ourselves in a time of trial, we call out to you and ask for your peace to come near to us, for you to be present with us. And so, God, we lift up those names and situations before you today. You already know them. But we come before you with them so that we can draw ourselves into conversation with you, that we can give those, entrust those to you as we go deeper into our relationship with you. So we pray for Sarah this morning as she delivers her baby. And we pray for safety for them. And we pray that they would know that you are with them. We remember those this morning that we know and love that are experiencing all kinds of health um, issues. We pray for um, Anne and Judy and for Lynn and for Murray. And we pray for others, God, who, that we know uh, well, who are experiencing different kinds of 
health problems besides cancer for Melanie and for Shelly, for others. We pray today, God, for um, those who are in long-term care and for the challenges that they face at this time where they're not able to receive visits that are so um, essential to their mental well-being. Uh, we pray for the workers who care for them. For all those on the front lines of the virus, God, for doctors and nurses, for um, companies who are providing essential services, for those who are serving in quiet ways in communities and in cities around our world to care for one another, to reach out for one another, to be um, the peace of Christ in the midst of the storm for one another. God, we pray that you would use us, that we, you would use us for yourself and for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get to our time of worship, we give back to God. Um, as we've been made aware, giving is difficult during these times, at least financially, to the church. But you can continue to do so if you're part of the Kezprez family, even by going to kezprez.ca and on the front page. But we can also give back in other ways, as Allison mentioned, being present with a neighbor or to show the goodness of God in our daily lives. So we'll sing together, God is so good. You might not know the verses, but chances are you know the chorus. separate your steadfast love who can escape your faithfulness an endless sea full of grace and mercy we sing
my cornerstone, we sing God is so show the goodness of God in our own lives. May we live out that goodness as we give back, not just of our gifts, but of our time and our very lives. Draw us closer together and draw us closer to you, we pray. For Christ's sake. Amen. Our closing worship song is How Great Is Our God with a then a chorus that I think you'll know well. the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us all and give us peace. Amen. So thank you for joining us again. Um, 
just a reminder for our own folk, look for some emails this week concerning uh, grow groups as well as uh, children's worship. Um, and join us again next week. Uh, again, there was a little issue with YouTube. I think you had to have a YouTube account with us to get on as it was private. So we'll make sure that gets posted on YouTube as well. Uh, but please keep safe. Uh, social distancing, or maybe we should say physical distancing, but continue to keep in touch with uh, friends and neighbors and family. Wash your hands um, and just uh, keep safe. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.